Okay, so uh, we saw that back projection doesn't work. The images are far too smooth. And uh, let me give you a simple reason why. What we did is uh, something like this. We went to Fourier space, so this is F hat. And we added up all the, all the contributions of the data that we measured. Now, what you see is that the density of lines around here is much higher than further away. So if I just add everything up, then the values around zero will be much higher than the values very far outside. So, um, and you can easily see uh, that the density of these lines goes away with one over the norm of uh, psi. And uh, so the idea could be, well, if I multiply the, the, the image that I get or the data that I have over here with norm of psi in the Fourier domain, then everything might be fine. Right, so uh, you might have the idea that multiplying with norm psi in the Fourier domain would be okay. Okay, so um, there's at least we take from that uh, that uh, there's some irregularity in the Fourier domain, and we need to correct that. We can even interpret that uh, without using uh, the uh, inversion theorem. And uh, let's go back to what we're actually doing geometrically. Now, let's go back to our scene. So there's a circle. Let's assume there's a circle around here, and we're doing the back projection. Now, uh, this at this point over here, in the scene, actually, there's zero, so nothing is over here. But if we take the back projection, then we find that the value is not equal to zero, because there are some lines that cross the uh, circle, and go through, go through this, uh, this uh, um, pixel x1. So if I add them all up, even if I multiply them with a constant, then uh, they're definitely not zero. They are larger than zero. So in the back projected image, there will be a positive value over here, although this, does not, uh, this is not a point that belongs to the circle. Now, if I take um, a point that's very far away, then uh, this is valid as well. There are some lines that cross x that go through x2 and the circle. So if I measure up the measured value along these lines, then again, that value will be positive, although that, far, that point is very far away. And uh, it's not equal to 0, and it will, in fact, be larger than 0. However, uh, that will be smaller, because there are less lines going from here through the circle then they are from here going through the circle. So uh, that will be smaller, and you can easily see that the factor is again 1 over r, where r is the distance to the circle. Now think of this extremely small, and you will see that the effect of one dot, which is not equal to 0 over here, is something like 1 over r. Okay. So the reconstructed function for a dot will be 1 over r times a constant. OK, uh, on the other hand, we have that back projection is shift invariant. I mean, that's easily seen. If I move the circle around, then also the back projected image will move around. OK, so that means back projection is, in fact, a convolution. And we can find out what the convolution kernel is by plugging in the delta distribution. But we just realized that if we put in a delta function at the origin over here, then the reconstructed image will look like 1 over r. OK. So in fact, the, Fourier, the back projected image that we get after uh, that, uh, that we get is the original function f that we're looking for conv convolved with the function 1 over norm of x, where, of course, this again has to be interpreted uh, um, in, the, in the distributional sense. OK, good. Um, now, if we have this, can we somehow get back from the back projected image to the function f? 
And, uh, and let's first of all uh, look at convolution, what convolution theorem tells us. And I take the Fourier transform of dp, then that means that this is just f hat times the Fourier transform of 1 over norm x times the square root of 2 pi. Uh, and now taking the inverse Fourier transform, this says that the back projected image can be represented as f hat times 1 over norm x. Oops, there's a norm missing. And uh, actually that, um, uh, should be um, the Fourier transform of 1 over norm x, but we're in R2, and we proved that the Fourier transform of 1 over norm x is 1 over norm x. So inverse Fourier transform times square root of 2 pi. Okay, so what we're actually doing uh, with uh, when we're computing the back projected image, we're convolving our original image with 1 over norm x, or we're multiplying the Fourier transform of f with 1 over norm x in the Fourier domain. Okay, so um, that gives rise to a simple algorithm. And uh, that's, that one is called row filtered layer gram. And uh, this one is really used in some computerized tomography and in some CT devices, special ones. There's another one we'll get to know, but anyway. So we could compute the back projection. Now, this is the back projection, uh, and we compute the Fourier transform of the back projected image. And again, this is now on a rectangular grid, so that will be very fast. We can, we can compute the Fourier transform using, or approximate it, using the fast Fourier transform. So that's all very nice. Okay, so we can compute BP hat. Now, this is nothing but F hat times 1 over norm x. Okay, so all we have to do is if we now uh, um, uh, multiply that with norm or norm xi, right? Uh, so if we multiply that with the norm of xi, then what we have is f hat. Okay, so that's definitely something we can do. We just compute the Fourier transform. We compute, uh, um, these are some, um, that gives us the approximation on for the Fourier transform on some values xi k. Uh, I multiply with norm of psi k, and what I get out, the Fourier transform of f, and again on a regular grid, of course. And uh, the, uh, by the way, the um, engineer notation for this is we said rho of psi equal to norm of psi, and that explains the, uh, the name rho filtered. Okay, now we have f hat, and all we need to do is compute the inverse Fourier transform of, et, uh, of f hat to get f, Maybe that's difficult again. No, of course not, because um, BP was uh, on a rectangular grid. So BP hat was on a rectangular grid with FFT. And we can, so uh, F hat is also on a rectangular grid. And uh, we can easily, again, compute the inverse Fourier transform using the fast Fourier transform. So that's extremely fast, looks good. And um, I should say everything is up to constants here but uh, this is a viable algorithm. Now we will, this was a little bit fishy because I, I went to distribution theory for this one. I will give you a better mathematical uh, explanation in the next video. Um, let me conclude this, uh, these remarks on Fourier slice theorem uh, with um, that um, properties of the Fourier transform um, Try, uh, transform, turn into properties of the radon transform immediately. So um, when you have something, when you have some property of the radon trans of the Fourier transform, uh, where that immediately translates into a property of the radon transform using Fourier slice theorem, and that again says that well, more or less radon transform and Fourier transform are not the same, but they're very, very closely related. Um, for example, let's compute the radon transform of d to the alpha f at the point theta and s. And I say that's theta to the alpha, d to the absolute value of alpha, rf of theta and s, where, of course, again, the deriv derivative over here is with respect to the second variable. So that's with respect to s. Okay. Um, to prove that, um, 
of course we need to uh, take the Fourier transform because uh, uh, we want to use the um, Fourier slice theorem. So we take the Fourier transform of this one over here with respect to the second variable, always same thing. So that's now the Fourier transform of R to the d alpha f of theta and sigma. And uh, that's the same as the Fourier transform of d to the alpha f of sigma times theta times the constant 2 pi n minus 1 uh, over uh, n minus 1 over 2. And uh, that's just inserting Fourier slice. Now uh, we have the computation rule for uh, d to the alpha f hat. So more or less that says takes the argument that's sigma times uh, theta take it to the alpha and uh, up to a constant. Again, that's the same as the Fourier transform of f at the same point. So that's f hat of sigma times theta. So just inserting the computation rule here. Uh, now I plug in Fourier slice again. So f hat of sigma times theta is r f hat of theta and sigma. The two pi goes away. And uh, now I have sigma to the absolute value of alpha of a Fourier transform times i to the absolute value i to the absolute value of alpha. And uh, again, using the computation rule for the Fourier transform, now the other way around. This is nothing but theta to the alpha, and you can read it yourself. Now we take the inverse Fourier transform with respect to the second variable, and what comes out is exactly what we wanted to prove. Okay, so um, that's nice. And uh, we have a way of proving many theorems about the radar transform, but uh, we won't. Rather, we'll now concentrate on um, proving even one more algorithm for performing inverse radon transform.